Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, or good day, wherever you are in the world. And welcome to the next episode of No Dice, No Glory. Sponsored by our jobs that actually pay us money, we're coming to you not at all live from an abandoned arms factory deep under a mountain in West Virginia. We are proud to proffer to you the finest in wargaming coverage. Without any further ado, let's get this show on the road. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Tales of the Sail, episode 32, the end of the summer, which is being recorded in October, which the astute among us will know is when summer really ends. And it is starting to get cold, so I know that's true. Um, Tonight, we have a special guest. Um, We're joined by um, Glenn, the gentleman farmer Van Meter. I'm a special guest. You're a special guest. Finally. You're always special, Glenn. Well, that's Um, true. And all the way from Oregon, um, fresh off a hot musical recording session um, with some recorder students and somebody who plays the piano, is Joe Forrester from Blood and Pigment. Thanks for being here, Joe. Thanks for having me on again. That wasn't a recorder session. It was an elementary kid teach a lesson session. <laughs> no hot recordings. No, it'd be awesome. Like, But if they're like playing you're... recorders, it's a recording session. I thought that was the pun Tom was making. Oh, I guess. No, I wasn't making the pun, but now that you made it, it makes me hate myself for saying it. <laughs> I'm really sorry. <laughs> really sorry about that. Rely on the dads for dad jokes. You're darn right. We got two dads here that are very adept at dad jokes. Uh, so we're going to go around the horn here and talk about what we've been up to. And Joe is going to give us the full lowdown and briefing on the Summer of Plunder, um, which has just finished wrapping up. And you were just talking to me before we started recording and said you're 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 grateful for a bit of a lull in uh, in recording duties because you, you've got a, we get a lot of submissions, right? We get a ton of them. Yeah, it was a good bit of work keeping track of everything this year. I'll go through mine, and and Glenn's is mostly stuff I made up to put on the notes to annoy him. I have been uh, mostly focused on being back in school. Uh, In New York, we start after Labor Day. So I start out on uh, on my four different – Glenn is messing with the show notes while I'm I'm trying to read them. That's not Um, me. It's not you. It's not you at all. (laughs) Um, they're, um, they're they're taking their own. It's just it's taking on a life of its own. Mind. Yeah. Then why does it say you when I look at the Google Google document and it says that you're editing it right now? All right. Anyway, school That's is mine. beginning. Uh, I've basically finished painting a saga army. Uh, I have the Irish, and I've been slowly but surely adding to it. So at this point, I think I've painted fully and based fully uh, about I want to say forty figures, which is more than I would ever use in a battle um even though some of them are levies but i felt obligated to buy every single thing in the collection because i'm a completionist so i have even more to paint before i'm done unfortunately that does not involve me finishing up any of the new year's resolutions that i said i was going to be doing and the deadline is growing closer um it's like being a crash dummy in a car and seeing the wall rapidly approach you um so it's going to be it's going to be interesting. I know what your resolutions are again. Um oh gosh. So mine are Hold on, I have it in front. I of think me. that actually holds for one. I was trying to look it up. I have 7 of them. Fully paint an English or a French starter box, 2 fully paint a Dutch starter box, 3 paint and rig a 6th rate ship, 4 host and run a convention game, which I get credit for. Paint a starter force for a period of time I don't have an army for yet, which is the Saga army. Um, build a terrain port, which includes a pier for three ships, six new pieces of scatter terrain, and three buildings. I'm also supposed to write an article per month. I just went absolutely ham on it. So I'm probably at like two out of seven right now. Three out of seven, maybe. Um, so I got to pick up the speed, but... I was going to say, I'm pretty sure this this covers the pick a system or time period that you're not currently working on and do a force for it. Yeah, I've got that and the convention game done, but most of my, my blood and plunder painting is lagging way behind. I mean, I only gave myself two goals, and I have neither of them done. That's true. <laughs> and uh, if the pass is any indication, you're going to struggle to get to the end, but we'll see. Well, okay. I think I'm exempt from trying to get the starter set built and painted. <laughs> 
considering we might not even have it till December. Well, no, I'm sorry, folks. It's shipping in November, but I don't suspect that I can get it built and painted by the end of the year. No, I don't think so either. Um, I don't know. I'll still harass you about it and post taunting things about it on Facebook, but uh, yeah, I don't think it's realistic to expect you to have it done. I had a regular kind of meetup with my friends Shane and Rod, who are my local gamers in the area, and we are starting to try to get back together to have regular weekly painting sessions, because it's always a big motivator to get it done with friends, and um, we... I apologize for the dogs barking in the background. They are barking at nothing, um, but they do it on a regular basis. We did the Calvert-Marie Museum this past September, which will give you a full rundown about uh, at the back half of the episode. And other than panicking about New Year's resolutions and kind of sitting here in my office looking around all the stuff I haven't made yet, that pretty much covers what I've been up to for the last month. So... Glenn, what have you been doing? Oh, I acquired a 3D printer probably sometime around the last episode, or maybe a little before that. Um, but I have been 3D printing like a madman. Uh, I was I was given permission to get a 3D printer on the condition that I could print bobbins for Corinne's spinning wheels <laughs> and stuff for the fiber shop. So I got about a week worth of use for printing just stuff for me. And then since then, it's been going practically nonstop trying to print stuff for Corinne and her fiber shop. Do you really need that many great. bobbins? Like, I'm not familiar enough with how the spinning wheels work, but is it something that you just constantly need? Um, kind of. They, the more bobbins you have, the easier it is, because, like, you spin the fiber onto a bobbin, and then usually you spin fiber on multiple bobbins, and then you unroll those when you're spinning them into, like, Kind of like rope, much yarn. A lot of yarn is like rope in that it's it's multiple pieces spun together and twisted together. So, like, let's say you would, sorry for the spinning lesson here, but, like, you spin the fiber into a very thin strand of, yeah, very good pirate content. So if you're ever stuck on an island and you need to make yourself some rope, here's how you do it. Out of your back hair? Yeah. <laughs> What movie is that referencing? I, don't, I think it's Pirates of the Caribbean. That's right, it is. Jack Sparrow. So you, you, you would spin it all like clockwise. You'd make a single strand, and then you'd take several of those single strands and spin them counterclockwise to make a much larger, thicker strand. And when you're listening to uh, older books about sailing, let's say, if you need a hawser cable or something like that, where it's like a four-inch cable, it that's what it is. is, is they've just continuously made like increasingly larger ropes out of hemp fiber and spun it together huh and you can find some pretty cool videos online because there's still some people who make rope the old way for sailing ships how have the fiber festivals gone because you've you've been to a few of them at this point haven't you she's had one so far this fall and then we've got like one each of the next three weekends so um we're doing okay attendance is a little bit down because it was a rainy weekend um, so she, she did all right. Um, we're hoping the next few are big. And then the, the big one is in the spring. We haven't gotten a chance to use the stuff you gave us that looks really cool. It looks like a, like a washed out seascape, um, type of like the coloring, which I thought was really cool. Um, my wife is not doing a lot of knitting recently, but she is learning to crochet. So she might try to use it for that. Oh yeah. Um, well, I mean, if you or anybody else needs yarn to sp play with for one reason or another, you know, contact us. We're happy to send it to you for a fee. Yeah, drop Glenn a line. He'll send you some bobbins, too, as a bonus. Drop a line. <laughs> Maybe. 3D printing is incredibly cheap. I'm not trying to make these dad jokes. And Joe just points <laughs> out that I'm basically doing it. Right now, I hate though. myself. I hate <laughs> myself so much. You're just one kid away from dad jokes. I don't even have any kids. I'm making dad jokes anyway. You have, you have like cargo shorts and New Balances lined up already? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah I do. I do. <laughs> so I aside wish. from that and the 3D printing, um, I was I've been resigned about my New Year's resolutions and how they probably aren't getting done. 
the next thing to paint for me. There's is, something to be uh, said for consistency on these New Year's resolutions. So. That's true. Yeah, we're equal opportunity failures. Yeah, exactly. I'm gonna say the the painting challenges really helped me get stuff done, but they were not, um, let's say, constructive. Um, so I thought I could get the British Marines done next, but I forgot that the first thing we need to get done is Secret Santa. So oh, yeah. for those okay. who haven't heard about this, and for those who have, Adam Horton posted yesterday, which would be October 4th, um, that the Secret Santa is going this year. Um, I encourage everybody to participate. Uh, what happens is you contact Adam Horton, and you give him your name, address, so that somebody can send you something, and your preferred faction. So, like, if you're a Spanish player, you tell them Spanish or what have you. Um, and then he will give your info to a random person once he's got the group together. And then you have until December 1st, so you get two months, approximately, to get a blister of some kind. So a four-man set of minis or, like, a single special character. And you can you you paint up that unit and you send it along to your secret Santa, and in turn, somebody will have your name, address, etc., and they will send you a painted unit. It's been incredibly fun. We've I've participated two years now. Yeah, me too. I did two years in a row. Um, the first year I got you, so I just sent you yes. the, the whole unit of militia that I had done. Um, yes. I still have them. I still use them. They're great. Uh, the next year, yeah. I got Dexter Hyde, which was intimidating because he's a way <laughs> better painter than me. Um, but I did the best I could on some Milicianos Indios, and and uh, he's used them in a couple of battle reports that I've gotten to see him do, or there's a couple little uh, dioramas he's set up where I've gotten to see them see them on there. So I'm glad he liked them. Um, and the the models that I got from people were great. I got um, a special character that was like Christmas themed, so it's like a, a horseman with like really well painted and i don't think i ever figured out who that was that sent it to me because they didn't give me a return address um it just sort of mysteriously showed up in the mail and then uh last who was it i thought it was one of the north carolina guys but i could be wrong oh you might be right um and then i think i also got a north carolina guy last year gave me some some coppers that were painted like a really like um bright fun shade of blue and I, i've played with them a bunch of times so they're great Joe, did you do the Christmas Secret Santa thing last year or no? I know, I've done it twice. You did it I don't twice. know if I did it last year or not. I think you did, because I think last year was the year that Preston did the Lost Boys for you. Oh, yeah, the cooking <laughs> ears with tails and ears. <laughs> oh, my gosh, that was great. Yeah, I remember that. I don't know what to do with them, though. You oh, play them fun. as buccaneers. Yeah, you play them as buccaneers. What? I don't know that's what probably what they would, would have grown, be grown up to be anyway. Yeah, you know? exactly. So last year, I think I actually got Adam. The first year, I got a new player who I think was in England, and I I don't know if he still plays or not. Um, and then last year, I got Adam himself, and I think I received minis from Evan Botkin, which were some ex like wonderfully painted English militia, where he accidentally like perfectly matched the scheme of my English militia that I already had, that were commission nice. painted. Yeah, to the point where like. I mistakenly group them together all the time because I they all have an identical scheme, which is good. It works out very well. Well, what I will say is that when this thing gets edited and released, I will make sure that I um, I dox Adam Horton so that you know to send him your information if you want to participate in Secret Santa. Um, so we'll post it on our Facebook page to give him a little extra coverage. And uh, if you want to do it, do it, uh, because I, I I found it really enjoyable each time. It's fun to just paint something up for somebody else and to get something unique in return. Um, it's just a fun way to, to do some hobbying during the season. So highly recommend it and check the, the link for this if you're listening to it with enough time to sign up. Yep. Oh, and I mentioned that I had a new player in England. And, you know, you if you are a longtime listener of the show, you probably constantly hear Tom and I joking about sending stuff overseas being expensive. Adam made sure ahead of time that it was okay that I had a foreign um, 
address to send to. He yes. won't just like give you a guy in Timbuktu and you know have fun paying the shipping for that. He will okay it with you that you're not sending it domestically. So if you're inside the United States, it's probably only going to cost you about five bucks to to send. Yeah, you can um, tell him and specify like, hey, I don't, I don't think I want to ship internationally, and that's fine. Like I usually volunteer to do that because I've done it before. So I'm sure I'm on some terror watch list because I keep sending packages to Norway and you know Holland. Um, but uh, that's fine. I, <laughs> I still I still remember the time I sent Dennis Matt Varnish like a, a bunch of blisters and I just grabbed whatever box I had lying around that was used for a piece of like plumbing pipe that I had used to repair something on the furnace. And because it had the residue from the pipe in it, um, it got flagged as a possible pipe bomb by Canadian um, customs. <laughs> and so they, nice. they tore into it. I also put like a fake address on it. Like I've, yeah, I, I really made it the most suspicious looking package possible. I, I I'm surprised the FBI didn't come to talk to me, but he did get it eventually. Um and I promise that whoever gets whoever I get picked for in Secret Santa, I will not send you um a pipe bomb. I will in fact send you painted miniatures, I, I promise. Which brings us to Joe and the summer of plunder. So so Joe, give us the rundown. First of all, tell us what you've been up to, um, hobby wise and I th- you've been doing a lot of the preview stuff for Raise the Black. You published a bunch of articles on your site, um, which I would strongly encourage people to go check out, um, talking about the new sprues and stuff. So just, yeah, give us the rundown. Tell us what you've been up to. Yeah, I've had a kind of perfect storm of work and hobbies all wrapped into one, kind of like you with school going back and the summer of plunder wrapping up on Labor Day and school starting on Labor Day. And my church had a big event here on just a couple weeks ago, so I was not getting any sleep, but having a lot of fun. <laughs> um, yeah, working on the Summer of Plunder all. Oh, I was going to say, with that perfect storm, is that why that Dashing Rouge Dan Carlson uh, got to publish his article? That was an old article that we published a year ago, <laughs> previewing Blackbeard. Um, but yeah, Dan keeps uh, saying Dashing Rogue, but he spells it Rouge, which makes me laugh. Um, yeah, worked on the Summer of Plunder all We'll talk about more about that, but it was from uh, Memorial Day to Labor Day. Uh, since then, I've been getting a little painting in, working some more on some articles and videos for the Blood and Pigment media. Um, finally got a little bit of painting again. I didn't really get any painting or hobbying at all over the summer <laughs> because I was working this managing the campaign. I've um, uh, been playing about every week. I have Two friends that I kind of one week play with one, one week with the other at the store or my home. So I've been getting in some consistent games, play testing some historical scenarios for Raise the Black era uh, stuff, and teaching a couple new players at my local store as well. Nice. Doing a little bit in the Lord of the Rings LCG world too. That's my other big game that I played for a long time and have a podcast and YouTube channel on as well. So overall, how did the summer of plunder go like who were the winners um prizes you mentioned i think before we got on air got uh are just finishing getting sent out right i think glenn was complaining right before we got on that he hasn't had time to go to the post office but people that are waiting for prizes for him can expect them soon one presumes glenn soon in the firelock world that's right yes the the prizes will be out the door by the time this episode drops so if you're waiting on a prize for me, I'm sorry. Real life is kicking my butt. It went really well. It was a fun event. I hope everybody had fun. We had about 160 people, 160 different people. We had about, let me see, look at the numbers here. We had 1,602 games logged, it looks like. Wow. Or 1,690, it looks like. So it was a big uptick from, we started it last year. Um, but last year was a little harder to get games in just because of the world situation. And we kind of amped up uh, publicizing a little bit and had a lot of people on board. We had uh, Firelock helped a little bit and um, Dan, uh, Jason Klotz from Timber and Sale. He did a lot of, helped a lot with helping build spreadsheets and stuff to keep track of data and give prizes out for oak and iron which i kept forgetting and neglecting oak and iron as part of this campaign 
Um, we had um, Blunderden. What's his name? I feel horrible now. Dexter Hyde. We had Dexter Hyde from Blunderden help out. He did a lot of. He was an English commander and gave out a lot of prizes. So there's a bunch of people that worked together to uh, put on the event. A lot of people donated prizes. I think we gave out uh, over three thousand dollars worth of prizes, not counting the international shipping. That's nuts. That's that's nuts. We had about, uh, like I said, about 160 different players uh, join, about, and we sent prizes out to at least like 50, 60 different people. So a lot of people hopefully got some prizes out of it. Um, there was lots of different prizes to win. There was your overall winner of how many points you got. Um, that was Jason Klotz. He played a lot of games. I heard several people when we were done say, I, my wife was very happy this is Indian. And his was one of them. <laughs> and so was mine. Um, but there was a bunch, bunch of winners. Uh, you can look at our campaign finale post on Blood and Pigment and see all the different winners of the end of campaign prizes. We had a bunch of prizes throughout the campaign as well, including some na national prizes from the commanders. and Just a lot, lot of fun going on. Really fun to see everyone's pictures. Um, and all joined together in accomplishing different objectives throughout the campaign. Um, I had a lot of fun. I hope everybody else did too. That's an overview of it. So of all the factions that played, and I know you had a ton of Oak and Iron games submitted, you, you said over a thousand submitted, which is, it, it's, it, grow, it grew exponentially from what it was last year. Um, I know, thanks to Nigel Vega complaining consistently to me, that the natives didn't win. Fill me in on your, your top three. What were the top three factions from third to first? Factions or nations? Uh, nations. Uh, the English won. Ugh, the ugh. English won uh, by a pretty good margin. I think it... Uh, I think that's Dexter Hyde with his awesome uh, prize support that he did himself. Yeah, he worked hard. He wasn't always pestering everybody, but he had some good prizes that he put love and effort into. And <laughs> there was a couple of weeks where they, he was offering a prize that people were just uh, logging a lot of games. So, yeah. Bribery helps. No, it really did. I mean, I mean, he's he's basically offering you like a working twenty-eight millimeter blacksmith shop, and you're like, "Yeah, I'll log some games for you." I feel like even some of the rival commanders probably did. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But so the English won it. The Spanish were in the lead for a little while, um, but they sure. they started to fall off. The Spanish and, and English uh, actually went. We're going back and forth throughout the whole campaign. Spain, Spain would pull ahead, then English, England would pull ahead. So that was fun to have some good, strong competition the whole time. Um, the English had a couple people who were logging a ton of games. The Spanish didn't have, they had less people logging lots of games. They had the most different players. So they had the largest roster. A couple of players were con playing consistently a couple times a week. But there was nobody playing 30 games a week for <laughs> or anything crazy like that. But they did really well. They did not do well last year, so it was fun to see uh, them do so much better. I do remember that. Um, so I, I'd say because of the process by which the entries were taken, I know that like you didn't require people to submit a list. Um, it was just the pictures, the factions played, and, um, and then that was it. You just fill out the form. Um, which which is a smart way to do it because it meant that it it just the simplicity of it meant it was very easy to log games, very easy to get involved. Um, but seeing it on your end, you wind up with this really interesting bird's eye view of all these games flooding in. So you've you've been kind of drowning in data in a way that <laughs> a lot of interesting data. Yeah, we don't. So like, what are some interesting trends or or things you noticed happening in terms of? Um, in terms of the types of lists you might have seen stumbled across, or we actually don't get the lists. We don't ask for that. So we know the nation, we know the faction, and we get some pictures of the game. So that's the data we get, but not necessarily how many the points itself, they spent yeah. on what model. Yeah. So, so what trends were you noticing as the data was flooding in? Like, what were some patterns you started to see, or or interesting things you noticed? The data is kind of weird because a few players skew it. A lot. So of those 1,600 games, one person did 135, 10% out of the 160 players. And there was three players who played more than 100, and they tended to play 
there was one guy who played Spain the whole time, and he played 100 games. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so it's a bit skewed. But his his were, like, regular, like, four a week. Yeah, he played. Or whatever it worked out. Like, that is an impressive level of commitment to play over the summer. Like, I, that's. Yeah, it wasn't like he, he didn't just do, like, here's a burst of 10, no. and, you know, nothing, and another burst of 12. Like, he submitted, the, like, clockwork. Um, I just want to know what it's like to be a person who can play regularly. <laughs> that would be, yeah. I was the faction commander. I'm not the faction commander with the least games, but I only reported two because that's all I got to play during the summer. All I have to say, the data is a little skewed because of that, so it's not like the average. Some of the point, the numbers are wonky just because of how intensely some people play the game. But interesting items. There's a lot. Most Spanish players of anything. I was blown away by that. Last year, the Pirates won by a good margin. This year, they did not do very well. But a lot of people were playing Spain. I didn't know, don't know why necessarily, but that was interesting. Um, the Dutch, or for all the oak and iron stuff, there was a very high percentage Dutch played over anything else. And English were barely played at all for oak and iron, which is strange because I think they're really good. And French, oak and iron was barely touched either. Some of it was probably Jason Klotz, but I want to say that like, Half of the Dutch games were oak and iron. Yeah, probably at least. From what I remember seeing. Uh, let me look at... And, semi not surprisingly, we had a large number of Dutch players playing Dutch. So half of my prize pool is going to the Netherlands. Yeah, there was 121 oak and iron Dutch games played. There was 26 Spanish, 27 English, 26 French. Two, a couple nat uh, natives... No, and 29 pirate so like 20 something of everything and then 120 dutch <laughs> so so all of them together added up to the dutch less than <laughs> yeah uh we another weird one is the legendary factions were barely touched with the exception huh. of morgan's buccaneers morgan got played a lot but everybody else hardly touched kids privateers hardly any uh the spanish legendary it's hardly any that is until the very last week. The last week, our objective was to play the legendary commanders, so we got them all played eventually. But I was going to ask: Was there any legendary faction that didn't get, or any faction at all that didn't get played whatsoever? Every single faction in Blood and Plunder and Oak and Iron got played during the campaign. Nice, nice. nice. But guess which ones were the very last ones to get played? And I kind of threw out. These couple have not been played yet, and then people played them. I don't know if they would have otherwise, but guess which ones were the last to get played? Uh, Heinz, Commas of Arders? Nope. Uh, Arm, um, Armada de Barlavento? That was not... Nope. What about uh, Church? The um, the Church's Raiders one? That one, right? No, he or actually not? got more than uh, some of the legendary. He got 11 plays. Uh, Dexter sent a Church model out to a a player as a prize, and then he played them several <laughs> times after that. <laughs> nice. So Third who was protection. it then? So who were the last two? The French legendaries. All three of them didn't get touched. Filibusters Now, the Filibusters de Groff, and Iberville's Expeditionary Force. None of them got played to like the last week. Oh, wow. Huh. The Graf faction is quite good, too. But... Yeah, he's great. I, I, I bought that model specifically to paint him up because I thought he's, his story is just so fun that mm -hmm. I just wanted the model and I wanted to be able to play the force even if I knew you know he's so, he's so darn expensive that the odds of you being able to field something competitive at 100 points is like zero um but you know at bigger games you could you could pull them out I feel like you need the bigger point games to play those kind of legendary commanders legendary factions That's the bone I want to pick with people people say oh the historicals are too expensive to play at 200 points or whatever but that's half the fun of the game is playing the fun, cool, custom commanders with have the history all wrapped up inside them. So play them anyway. 200 yeah, points, anyway. the 30 point is a little much, but the 20, 25 point, especially if you both agree to play a legendary or a high point commander, that's a lot, a lot of fun. You should do it. Don't be no, afraid of the points. I brought one last time I played Although, a game and it was well worth it. I will caution, you probably don't want to take a 40 point character in a 100, list, 100 point list. No, we're, we'll talk about that later on. <laughs> <laughs> at 200 man. points, you we'll, can we'll use pretty much later. any commander. It's a little spendy at 40 points, but there's only like 
two or three 40 point commanders in the cave. All right, one more qu uh, question from the data. There was three factions that were only played once. Really? I take a guess at those. Other than, other than the French, French legendaries, legendaries, right? All the legendaries got played multiple times by the end of the campaign. That there's three factions that only got one play. And one of them is one of the best factions in the game, according to my humble opinion. <laughs> you have the village idiots. Was it the village idiots? No. <laughs> they got five plays. Mostly yes. me. <laughs> wow. No, I'm I'm working on it, Joe. Like I promised you when I saw you at Historicon that I was gonna put that together. And with God as my witness, I will make sure I have a fully painted group of motley villagers along with the appropriate fortifications that can hide inside of a fort and wait for people to go away. Things from the basement has some New England houses that are perfect for a garrison house. Look really great, and they're very functional. Ooh, I'm going to put that in my bookmarks. Now. Mm, were they South American tribes lists? Uh, two of them are native lists, but they're not South American tribes. South American tribes actually got the second most of any native tribe. Really? I remember hearing that somewhere from Nigel. I was surprised that the native factions from Fire on the Frontier didn't get more play. Like mo I think most people just have the native box, so they were playing the South, the South natives because they had those models. Um, yeah, but yeah, and... the natives did not get very many games. They got 119 using native factions, and the lowest anybody else was 196 from the pirates. So they got almost half of the lowest, of the next lowest nation. And this... I was also surprised by how few the pirates play. Most people when they start playing this game like want to play the pirates as a faction. Like a lot of the new play players I've seen buying up boxes and starters are trying to ask, well, how do I make how do I make my guys a pirate faction? So a little surprising. I figure that was fine. They're going to really blow everybody out of the water next year with Raise the Black factions. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think so. Probably. I thought Dan was going to continue his success from last year, and then um, we it started out off with like six strong, weeks of yeah. Spanish winning. Yeah. Well, yeah, but then we started six weeks of Spanish winning. Mm -hmm, so Which was boom. very mind-blowing. So what is the plan for next year? I know it's early days because you literally just finished, but what do you think you you might be looking to do? Do you want to do it again? Would you want to make it bigger? Would you want to keep up the same thing because it worked so well? I think we learned some lessons from it. It was a good bit bigger than last year. It took a lot of upkeep on my end, trying to keep track of numbers and stuff. So we're trying to automate some of that, integrate the entry form with the spreadsheet so it automatically populates rather than having the human error factor in there, putting moving numbers around. And that would save me a lot of work. So we're trying to do that. We're also going with trying to add a map element to it. So there's a little more visual representation of who's winning. And we've already got a system designed and we play tested it, but we have, there were some major issues. With, uh, it was kind of a mini game for the commanders on top of the whole system, but it turned out kind of wonky. So we have to adjust some things, but yeah, um, a similar sort of thing where everybody's able to participate. Our goal is to get people excited about the game, get people playing the game, stretch people and kind of the objectives are really fun to encourage people to explore corners of the game that don't always get hit. Uh, so I think that was a lot of fun and a good use for the campaign. And another big goal is to get the game out in front of more people. So we might incentivize playing at your local game shop or um, a little more next year or be more clear for one thing and incentivize teaching new players as well next year. I do want to say automation is going to be great because um, as a fellow busy dad, I know Joe is doing like, it seemed like an hour of work a day entering data. It was about for all 10 days. to 12 hours a week, I think. Well, there you go. It's like an hour and a half a day. Good Lord. Uh, the Doing the updates. Well, the automation is one thing, but it's going to help. But the biggest time sink was managing pictures. <laughs> and I think the photos are one of the really fun elements of the campaign where people can share uh, their battle boards and their forces and stuff. And I really enjoyed that. I hope everyone else did too. But I had every picture has to be downloaded and moved into a folder and organized so it's accessible. And then draw pictures into the update at the end of week. And then keep track of 
so yeah, I have this huge, massive folder of folders of pictures from every single player that, yeah, they all had to be managed and my home internet isn't great sometimes. So sometimes it was, took a long time. So anybody listening, make sure your camera setting is kind of low so they aren't too big a file size. Actually, I, I can adjust how they get sent to me, I guess, too. But that was the biggest time sink, actually, just managing the photos, which I don't know how to change because I think that's a really fun part of the campaign. But it was also a time sink. And um, when, so I think any any kind of parting thoughts on like your favorite favorite moment, favorite battle report, or maybe like your favorite thing about the Summer of Plunder overall? One of my favorite things, like I said, is just seeing everybody's battle board. I feel like I know a lot of these people now just by seeing their forces and <laughs> miniatures so much. So I personally, just from fiddling with everybody's pictures and, man and entries, felt like I know the community a little bit more, which is kind of creepy because you don't know me, but <laughs> I found that fun. Um, <laughs> I really had a good time seeing people do the objective and say, this was fun, or I'll never do that again, but just try new things in the game. Enjoy watching people teach new players and get other people excited about it. I enjoyed sending off emails telling people they won big prizes. That was fun. Um, I enjoyed the smack talk in the commander uh, chat. There was, I don't know how many pages of chat got spammed out of the commander, so that was pretty fun <laughs> most of the time. It was fun oh seeing people gosh. say, what? I, that's not, I never knew how to play that before. Just a lot of people learn how to play the game better, more accurately by interacting over all these games. So a lot of good things came out of it. That was that was a recurring joke in the chat, is that the commanders didn't actually know how to play this game. Because some rule would come up and all of us would be like, wait, what? No one, no one knew this. <laughs> <laughs> for for instance, uh, the the memorable one was we were at a tournament and we were I was going over the heavy cover rules, and after I had been ignoring the chat most of the day and came back to like 170 messages, I then had to like drop a question in asking like with heavy cover like apparently this applies to melee question and the answer is yes I had no idea that cover ownership also applied to melee. Yeah, that's so a weird I've been one, playing that wrong for like two years. Yeah, I did a post during the campaign. Seven things you're probably playing wrong in Blood and Plunder. <laughs> that was one of them. Yeah, I remember that. Did that was that as a result of us having those various like eureka moments, or did that preface some of them? That brought some of them about. Yeah, that post. <laughs> <laughs> And some of the ones like, oh, wow, people are doing that wrong. I guess I need to add this, too. <laughs> I need to tell people what they're doing. Oh, man. It's, it's mm. a learning experience. I don't mind. I like a game with enough nuances to it that I'm always figuring something else out. Um, but like, it's a big still, game. It's there's still a lot of things you can do, to, yeah. and there's a lot of situations that covers, which is awesome and makes for a good depth. But it also <laughs> means you have to read the rule book several times so you catch things that you missed the first time because you never experienced them. So. Yeah, yeah, and you can get some you can get some real synergy going with some of the forces, and I can't even imagine. I know how much new stuff is going to be coming out with Raise the Black, and I can't even imagine the varieties that we will start seeing on the tabletop. Um, you know, right. in the new year, It'll be fun. There's lots of new historical commanders for people to not play. No, I I'm going to make sure they all get played, Joe. Um, All right. I'll do my best. I'll pull out every pirate because I don't care if I lose. We've already established <laughs> that pretty well. Um, so I think we we will stop there. But I will say, um, wait, hold on. I do want to. I did want to ask. Sorry. No, but I know we said Dexter Hyde in the English one. Which player got the grand prize? Oh do you yeah, yeah. I want to know that too. I don't think we mentioned that. It's in your article, I believe. Yeah. But let's look at my. Check the article. <laughs> Michael Verity. Oh, okay. congratulations, Michael. And congratulations. he was a great contributor this year. He uh, sent a bunch of, wrote up a bunch of really colorful and fun battle reports. I published some of them on Blood and Pigment just because they were so fun. Did a bunch of great pictures. He made a couple of custom scenarios. Had a lavish spread of terrain, huge armies. 
a very worthy winner. So really thankful to have all his entries and been able to send off that galleon with Guy's mom's sails. Oh, man. That's beautiful. On a galleon, too. I know. Wow. I know. Yeah. It's absolutely crazy. Um, well, check out Secret Santa, which will be kind of reminded, you'll be reminded of on the bottom of the, the podcast. We will take a break. Um, and when we come back, we'll be talking about uh, the Calvert Marine Museum um, and everything else. But a big thanks to Joe Forrester for joining us from, from the Pacific Northwest. And uh, we will have you on again. Just a reminder, yep. if you pronounce my name wrong, you're probably going to spell it wrong again. Oh, it's Joe Forster. That's right. <laughs> yeah, and I... I, I get on your case. And whoever gets you for Secret Santa, you were, you were waiting for a Peter Pan to lead the Lost Boys, right? Exactly. You see that Peter Pan. <laughs> oh, Lord. All right, we, we will be right back. Thanks, guys. Welcome to part two of Tales of the Sail, episode 32 and the summer. Uh, Glenn and I would like to thank uh, the esteemed Joe Forrester, um, celebrating uh, his time at Blood and Pigments and the amazing campaign that they were able to run. Uh, we gave you the whole rundown in part one. And because he has a limited amount of time, uh, we are recording this at a different time. Uh, and... We're going to now use this opportunity to talk about the the destination tournament that we ran. Uh, brief overview of that, and we will also be going through the trivia question winners from last time in September, and the new trivia question for this month in October. Uh, so, uh, I can do the rundown of the Marine Museum, um, and just talk about kind of the venue. But this was the first time actually physically going there that I was able to to see it in person. And the pictures didn't really uh, do it justice. There's a lot of stuff at the museum. I think people who came and got their chance to kind of tour it got their money's worth. There was a lot of activities going on. And for people that participated that like had their families or young kids come with them, I think that there are a lot of activities for them to do. And uh, Glenn, your your wife and her sisters and her mom and your kids, they all came to party. Is that correct? Yes, they did. And they even got to take the uh, the boat ride. They signed up for that ahead of time the day before. So at, I think it was 2 o'clock, they hopped on the boat, which it's like the Prince something or other. I really should have had this ready. Um they hopped on the boat and got to go on a ride around the harbor. Now, Samuel, your son that you named after a pirate to try to gain Correct. greater Kickstarter rewards, um, did Which he also work. enjoy the boat trip? I believe that he did, because Corinne stayed on shore with the baby. Um, but Samuel went. Apparently, he was very interested in like the boat itself. Um and enjoyed watching the water go by. I don't think the landmarks meant quite as much to him since he he's not even two, but he did seem excited about the boat ride from what I'm told. He seems like a pretty invested too, I have to say. Yeah, he's pretty smart. Not, you know, not just doing the normal parent thing, but like he's already counting to 10 and like knows his numbers and stuff and he's that's a little ahead of schedule. <laughs> he can be deceived, however, uh because I had bought a bunch of uh, munchkins for everybody for breakfast in the morning, and uh, your kids were just devouring them because I wanted to make sure that I, I pumped your kids full of as much sugar as possible before your wife tried to get them in the car. Um, so Samuel grabbed a few of the donuts, and then I would like move them to the other side of the table, and he would smile and slyly like run around the other side of the table to grab them. And then I waited for him to do it like a third time and simply like picked them up, put them under a sheet while he wasn't looking and then put them down another space. And he circled around rapidly and then pushed away the chair to gaze at what he presumed would be the new hiding spot for the donuts. And then I, I watched the joy fall from his face as he realized that there would be no more sugar. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think had, it, it made the ride back a lot more enjoyable for, for Corinne. Yeah, apparently they stopped off at a family friend's and um, 
had a nice, really nice dinner that would have rivaled what uh, you and I had at the rubber, uh, not the rubber duck. What was it called? The ruddy duck. Oh, the ruddy duck, which was great. I, I love that place. Yeah. And the beer was good. Yeah, we had a great time. I had a good dinner. Unfortunately, a lot of people like had to make the drive back or if they stayed over for the night, they stayed over on Friday night so they could get up on Saturday morning. And a lot of people just made the drive in one shot. Those North Carolina guys, respect, yeah. man. Uh, you guys hauled butt out of there. Um, but, yeah, I, I wish more people would suck around, but we didn't really formally set up anything. So next time, maybe, we do one of these things, you know, we'll have, like, a dinner kind of posted on the schedule if people want to join us. Um, because that was part of the appeal for me of staying an extra night, that I didn't need to leave at 6 to get home at, like, 2 in the morning up in uh, up in Danbury. Although there's nothing fun like 95 traffic. No, and if you're going to go, it's the time to go. Because I guess you'd get your way through Baltimore and through all of New Jersey without much of a problem. But I've even hit traffic on the George Washington Bridge at like 3 in the morning. Usually it's because people are too stupid to have easy pass. So they cause traffic jams when they're not permitted through the toll booth. That only oh, I thought it was easy pass. I thought it was because the governor shut the bridge down. <laughs> Time for some traffic in Fort Lee. No, sorry, that, that sorry. New Jersey, that New Jersey that's governor a, is that's a years old scandal. That's a years old <laughs> scandal. He's too busy shutting down a beach uh, and taking his family there for Memorial Day. Um, so he's he's moved on to other things. But uh, yeah, so I would say, um, what was your overall kind of opinion of the event itself? I was really happy uh, with we had sixteen people come. I think. The pirate costumes were great. The people who came dressed up were great. Um, I think Brian Reed and his son looked fantastic. I I wanted to give a prize out to one of them, but the other guys that that won little prizes for me really went went ham on it. So we we gave it a lot of awards for different things, and I I had a couple couple of custom objectives that I gave away to the 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 most like elaborate pirate costumes and so the three best dressed the three best yeah. dressed yeah i gave out a which oh i guess we'll get no. to that in a bit yeah 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 um but i thought the venue was great they were really friendly they were quick to help us set up we had a private room upstairs where people could eat and drop their stuff um demos for the public went really well uh i had a lot of kids trying to touch my stuff but i'm i'm kind of used to that cuz i teach at a school where students are eating cheetos and picking up my models you know they're varnished for a reason but uh all the parents bringing people through were great i think of the demos i ran maybe two of the eight demos were people that were like oh actually this is a game i might buy uh, and they were struck by kind of how quickly they were able to pick it up because most of the demos only run about 10 minutes 15 minutes and um my armor was incredibly comfortable considering the fact that i was wearing it all day uh, so I was really happy that I came adequately protected from possible Spanish raids. Yeah, um, except for the whole breastplate thing. So, you know, your shoulders are good. Yeah, I just, you know, I just wanted to protect the top. Yeah, yeah, that's probably the, the valuable part. And you didn't have a pirate costume because you were too busy doing the actual work of making sure <laughs> people had water and the tables were set up. But Yeah, I, I just wore... I just wore the, the shirt with a Jolly Roger on it, so I, that was good enough. But we did have the majority of our folks uh, that participated dressed up. Um, and that's not even counting the North Carolina crew that we mentioned. So I just want to give a shout out to these guys. Uh, it, in total, it was Drew Deming, Andrew Dobson. No, not Andrew Dobson. I'm sorry. Drew Deming, Nate Brown, Franklin Holland, and Alex Brown. Um, out of North Carolina, showed up with, like, team shirts. They were all wearing black shirts. They had a little logo on it about North Carolina that I don't remember what that said. But on the back, they had a picture of a sailing vessel, and it either said, depending on which who whose shirt it was, it said Team Holland, Team Spain, Team France, and Team England. Yeah, they came to play. Like, we are really impressed and proud of you guys, so kudos yeah so sorry we can give you points for dressing up because it wasn't super piratey but we were very impressed by the uh the uniform shirts we should look into doing something like that for uh our listeners next time we have some kind of event yeah because if if you get a bunch of them they're they're cheap it's one of those yeah. things where like the price goes down if you're ordering them in bulk but it's always high if you're getting like three um yeah i know because i i had a custom shirt made of me 
and this art teacher friend of mine that because we were going as chaperones to Italy. And so I took all these pictures of us and photoshopped them together and just said, like, it says roommates forever. And um, it has like our faces blown up in the most awful pictures imaginable. And I had matching shirts printed for the two of us. So I wear it every day on the last day of school um, just to embarrass the living hell out of them. And it works great. (laughs) But they were forty five dollars a piece. So wow. I I stand by my decision to spend that money. Um, you're talking to a man who, you know, bought two hundred and fifty dollars worth of armor from Czechoslovakia because he wanted to look like a conquistador and didn't feel like buying a plastic costume. Um, and I'm going to the Ren Fair uh, this weekend, so maybe I'll be able to get the breastplate. We'll see how much how much that's going to run me. <laughs> Best of luck there. Uh, so let's talk about the finishers. So um, let's talk. Let's talk lists, and let's kind of run down the list of of how people ended up. And Glenn, I'll let you take the lead on that one. Okay. So um, many of you probably already saw this, or hopefully you did, because uh, we do publish things to the blog, the No Dice No Glory blog. And I did write up an article, I think, about a week after this ended. Um. So at the and we had best dressed which tom gave out his this special treasure chest markers which are they on a, a cd is that about the size they are or are they like a 60 millimeter round it's a little smaller than a cd it's like a it's four inches in diameter total. okay okay then um so they looked really awesome is the end point i think several other people have gotten these things over the years but uh we had three participants who came uh, dressed completely in period style stuff. So that goes to Andy Hodges, um, Mick Paul, and a new guy who came at Andy's invite, uh, David Ramos, uh, who dress- showed up dressed really well. Um, so the three of them all got awards for that. Um, Poor David Ramos also, didn't he leave behind his like uh, his tablet? He left behind. He like left his tablet and his wineskin, which I did get in the mail, and he got them by Wednesday. Good, okay, good, good, good. Charmer you're good. Charmer. You're a good man. Yeah, we'll take we'll take care of you. If you leave stuff behind at our event, I'll make sure it gets to you, even if you live a couple hundred miles away. Um, yeah, we promise not to sell electronics for drugs or or models or more miniatures. Uh, yeah, probably more models. <laughs> if we're willing to mail stuff to Norway and. Uh, and Holland and Australia, then we're willing to just mail you back your stuff if you come to one of these tournaments and you leave it behind. But yeah, those three guys are the ones who got special awards for uh, for costumes. But there, there are a lot of people that really came to play. I'd say like the the, the close runners up were definitely Brian Reed and his son, who who were fantastic. Um, yes. Yeah. So after that. Prizes, prize support was generously provided by Mike from Firelock. Um, so he did us a super solid and sent me a just a box full of the new Siocast minis that he had used as tests. So it was a variety of poses, some of the weirder poses from the lines, like the sea dog running with the axe, or some of the marineros, or uh, some militiamen, that kind of stuff. Um, pieces that I recognize would probably test the mold a little bit more than others. And I dumped this box out and I started sorting it the best I could because I didn't want to make everybody like take the take ten minutes every time somebody won a prize just so they could sort through this stuff. So I took these models, dumped them out, and sorted them into four man blister packs the best I could. Now some of them came in weird numbers, so like. There were 10 Milicianos Indios, so I made two baggies of five. So some of the units were a little bigger, but in the end, I ended up with something like 57 individual baggies, just to give you an idea of how well supported this was by Firelock. And everybody got something. Yes. The base result was every player that participated got two blisters worth of minis. Um so if you look at the current prizes versus what we were charging for tournament entry, that there almost paid for your tournament entry. Plus you got admittance to the museum and we fed you. So I would say that overall um, cost to benefit ratio for this tournament was excellent. Now, anybody who won a prize, uh, 
got additional packs beyond that. So, like, first place, I think, walked away with five packs of minis. Um, and then yeah, that's, that's a starter got box. Fourth. Yeah, yeah, you essentially got a starter box. You got a starter you, box. If you manage to take this home. So, um, after we awarded the best dress, we then awarded um, the best painted, uh, which we had the museum staff actually go around and vote while all the players were at lunch. We they had Most players had left their minis out. Anybody who didn't, we made sure that their minis were looked at. Um, but the museum staff were able to pick Drew Deming, who, again, is one of the North Carolina guys. Um, as usual, our tournaments do not have a painting requirement. One of our players even showed up and literally took his models out of a starter box and plunked them on the table because he was that new of a player. That's um, cool. So no, there is no painting requirement, but we do host the um, the the best painted award if you want to participate in that. And it's generally fun to get like a third party to judge it. Like I know that it's like sometimes we'll have the players vote, but I like the idea of somebody who's like you know new to the game or like uh, just like a local local participant to just like take a look and admire them and say, oh, I like these the best. That's it's yeah, cool to... sometimes to get that done. Traditionally, at Critical Hit, I've had the whoever's working the register do the uh, nominations. And I don't know if we did this at Historicon, but I know at Fall In, I'll probably select somebody who is not a part of the tournament to come and take a look at the minis and let us know who the best painted nominations go to. Uh, so after that, we had favorite opponent, which often, like, everybody writes down different names, and we might have four people tie because, you know, two people wrote down the same guy's name, and, you know, four pairs of people did that, and then I've got to work it out based on some other criteria. This time, three for three, every opponent was, uh, the new gentleman, David Ramos. So... He was new to the game, didn't have minis, uh, and he walked away with half an army. So uh, I'm really excited because I've been talking to him since, and he's getting into it. He actually brought a friend with him, and his friend didn't play, but was so interested in playing that he had purchased an army online by the time he left for the day. Which is, which is awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So that's how um, much fun we have at these events. <laughs> I will also briefly point out, which I thought was cool, that because um, like so, uh, Brian Reed brought his son Noah Reed, and Noah was the was a close call for um, best sport because he he got two votes. Um, I think he's the a lot of, like the votes are spread around all over the place, so nearly every person got at least one vote for favorite opponent, which is a, it says pretty nice things about just the people who showed up, um, but. The fact that Noah's playing in his first couple games in a high stakes tournament and had two people vote him as uh, their favorite opponent says says a lot about him and his uh, his patience and sportsmanship. So good for him and good for Brian. Yeah, I think I think that was about ten. He's yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Brian apologized to Noah if I got his age wrong. I'm sorry. Well, if he's ten, he's a wise ten. Yes. Well, he's also the eldest of the you know more than half a dozen reads, so. Yeah, he's, he's probably also, learned a few things over the years. He's more mature than most of my 15-year-old sophomores. But to be fair to, to Noah, that's a low bar. So my sophomores <laughs> are the worst. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm sure he'd be acing my class and like giving looks to these people that are like sticking pencils as far up their nose as they can. Well, yeah, you teach history, and his dad is a history yeah. teacher. Yeah, so I'm sure he would just like, I'll just give him like a bye. Like for the first round, just like I don't, you don't need to take this test. No, you're cool. Uh, top three. Well, hold on, Rear Admiral first. Oh yeah, yeah. Poor Rear Admiral. Uh, went to Alex Brown. Uh, he was the only player to lose all three games. Uh, normally we'd have multiple players with that distinction, but the way we had to do the rounds this time, it ended up that um things didn't work the way it would normally in a strict Swiss style format. So. Instead of having two people who got three wins and two people who got three losses, we ended up with three three win people and two or one three three loss person and a lot more 
one win, two loss people than would normally occur. But I'll briefly point out for the benefit of people who are listening who wanted to come but couldn't come if we host one of these in the future. I think this innovation was, I believe, your idea, Glenn. I'm pretty confident it was, that in order to give people time to see the museum, we scheduled four rounds of which people would be participating in three. Uh, and this way, whatever round they were free, they could eat, they could walk around, they could check stuff out. And they had a good, you know, hour to do that. And that worked out pretty well. I think everybody got a chance to walk around the museum. Um, everybody got a chance to play their three games. The only downside to it as a device is what you said, which is the pairings were not straight Swiss. And we did wind up with three players that had three wins um, that just steamrolled people. Uh, because we, we couldn't pair them against each other and, and do what we normally would do, which is we'd take everybody with you know two wins and, and throw them together uh, and see who comes out. Yeah, but, this was not um, this was not strongest against strongest after each round. This was uh, well, I tried to do strongest against strongest within the round. Yeah, but... yeah, but I would say like level of play was still high. These guys did really well. I don't mean to take anything away from people that that succeeded because they they played well. They you know they earned their spot. They they did well. So exactly. And same same goes with Rear Admiral. Like you may not have gotten matched against uh, necessarily the other lowest at the time. You may have gotten unfairly beaten down. Anyways, uh, so that went to I don't know if I said his name already. That went to Alex Brown. So third place went to Jeff Wiltrout. He had only three strikes reported because there was we gave everybody a minus two bonus if you dressed up, um, and that almost came into play. Um, Matt McGeady took second. He did not dress up, and he had a natural two strikes going in. And first place was a player, Joe Richards, who had a natural one strike for the day. However, he dressed up, so that put him at negative one. Had Matt dressed up and Joe not dressed up and things had been reversed, Matt would have actually gone first, and Joe would have taken second. Yeah, so as it stands, it did not affect the outcome because they were separated by that that one strike point but it it potentially could have um and it did make a difference to the standings like down the line um yes, and, and the, the full standings can be seen uh, in the article that glenn wrote that he, he posted so you can check it up on the web page because it should be easily findable um but it published in september i believe so you'd have to check last month yeah and we do have a link to it on our facebook page as well if anybody cannot find the article and wants to read it, please feel free to reach out to me on yeah, Facebook. Yeah, we'll link to it I again. I will happily link it to you. So third place was Jeff Wiltrout. Second was Matt McGeady. And first was Joe Richards. Um, Andy Hodges finished fourth, just out of the running. Um, but he, yeah, he, he was close. And he played real well, too. So it, yes, it, he did. He, yeah, he had he had two wins and one loss. And, and I would say in a tournament with straight Swiss pairings, in only three rounds, he would have likely finished pretty. He would have likely finished higher. Um, so, like yeah. if this were a historic on tournament or a fallen tournament, he might have he might have pulled it out. Um, I was like so, just to get to see him because Andy's great. Um, I got to see his husband too, the guy who stitched the sails and stuff on his beautiful ship with its adorable crab. Um, and he yep. he dressed to success. He dressed to success too. He he looked great. Um, his boots in particular were really excellent. Um, and, uh, he gave me some pointers on how to, how to kit out my pirate outfit a little better. So thank you for that, Andy. Uh, a little bit on forces. Uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine of the 14 forces competing, uh, were militia forces, uh, cause this was a land game. Um, and then we also had one French expeditionary force, uh, French, or I'm sorry, Spanish armada. And... So we only ended up with like three Buccaneer forces in the end that were like more sea oriented, including Heinz, Comas of It was also overwhelmingly French. We there were two Spanish forces, and then two Dutch forces. There were five French forces: one, two, three, four, five English forces, two Dutch, and two, two Spanish. Spanish. No yeah. natives, unfortunately. Um, but, yes, English Militia with Joe Richards ended up winning the day. Uh, that was a tough list. I don't know how I necessarily might have might have beaten it with my standard go-to list. I'd like to try that out. Um, 
Joe actually, and this is just to prove that, like, you know, you don't have to be somebody that's constantly playing to win. Uh, Joe Richards, who won, I did an intro game with him, I think, two weeks prior to the tournament. Because he contacted oh, wow. me and said, hey, I've been playing, but it's just me and, like, a club, one or two guys from my club. We're not sure that we have the rules down. Can we do, can we go over this real quick? And I was just like, sure, I'd love to meet and play. So I actually got to play a game. And, um, yeah, he went on to to take the goal. And his list was also, like, piles of militia. So he took, like... He maxed out, if I'm recalling his list correctly, he had tons of kind of untested, untrained. I think it was, I think it was three full units of English militia and some sea dogs. So he, like he, and he played it, he played it well. He, he, and he, because of how big those forces were, he, that's how he avoided taking the strike points because he could suffer losses and he had to, you know, he had to suffer a certain amount of them before he would take the strike points. And that's, that's what helped him in the end. Yeah, because really I mean, it was devastated people he played against. It was thirty-three models in the force, so yeah, his strike points were at like eight or nine minis. So most like poor poor Frank Holland played uh, Heinz Kamas of Arders, and he had I think twelve minis. Oh god! And yeah. I think he ended up he ended up going up against Joe, and it was, I th- if I recall correctly, and it it was not great because yeah like a single volley from joe like leveled a unit and that was like half his force <laughs> so <laughs> yeah that was that's that's a high risk just just fyi even at a hundred point or at a hundred points including somebody like pete hine or um morgan you know somebody that's 42 one of those 42 point characters that chews up 40 percent of your list is very risky i'd say that's risky at 150 points I love Pete Hine, but um, I wouldn't have taken him a hundred point game. But he, it, it let him take a really elite list, and he had fun with it. But, but yeah, man, twelve models, whew, that's that's crazy. That's rough. That's rough. That's <laughs> that's, rough. that's what I'd expect from like a French list. I would say that running like all. all oh yeah, um, yeah. For the Bustier, yeah, they're super expensive because they're paying for all those special rules. I would say that there's really not. We still haven't seen enough games or enough tournaments on a regular basis for me to say that there's like a a meta for the game. There isn't really a bunch of established lists that are a way to win. I think people play differently, and the game lends itself well to that. Um, but and of course, you know, it changes the pace to whether it's land or sea. And we haven't even done amphibious tournaments. I don't know what that would look like. No, I feel like that's kind of the golden apple because the sea tournaments can be easy, you know, as you talked about in part one, because you just needed the sea mats and people could bring their ships um, for barrage con like you ran. But um, for the for the lands, but yeah, I mean, for the amphibious, you need boats, land forces, and the tables. And I don't think I've even played an amphibious game because I've never. I just haven't put the pieces together yet. Like I, I have the ships and I have the board and I have the terrain, but I just haven't done it. I guess I need to start playing around with it and testing it out. Yeah. I mean, in, in a tournament, the other trick is balancing it. Cause both players would have to, um, essentially both players have to have a ship because you don't know if you're going to be attacking or defending. So you have to have a list that can do both, which means you have to be able to be on land or on sea. And up until this point, our basic assumption is that most players are still new players. And they probably don't have boats. Um, so we're trying to make it as, as new player friendly as we possibly can, which means land tournaments the easiest way to go. I will say that that's likely going to change because as, as Raise the Black comes out and they start to to print out more of the plastic ships as opposed to that big thick resin, I think that the, the price of entry is going to get lower. And I think the number yeah. of people that are carrying ships is going to grow. Now, we've given out a couple of ships before. I think I've given out a sloop, and we gave out a bark. Bark. So we've given out... I'm, But I'm pretty sure I gave out a sloop at some point, too. You, yeah, we did. We did. So um, once those plastic sloops are out, you can bet that we're going to have a couple of those ready to be shipped somewhere, because um, we're going to make sure that people have ships. In fact, those will, that might even start being like you know part of the prize pool. 
Actually, I'm really, honestly, Tom, I'm really looking forward to these plastics because of the prize pools that we're going to be able to do for tournaments and things like that. It's not going to just be like, oh, here's a bluster of four minis. It's going to be like, here's 12 guys. That's half of a land force or a third of a, a, a sea force. Oh, yeah. it's. I will say that my friend Shane, who already has the land force, um, looked at some of the video previews for this stuff, looked on Blood and Pigment, saw some of the preview articles for these the plastic ships, and he's like, oh, that's that's it. That's what I wanted. He's like, I'm getting tons of ships now. And I, I think he's not alone in that in that plan. Um, let's do things we liked, things that we would do differently. So let's start with like each of us say two things that we think went well. Um, I'll start and I'll say that uh, I'm really happy with the turnout um, in terms of the players that came and the numbers we had. I'm happy that we got to 16 um, for something that was kind of a pie in the sky idea that we were able to, to put together in a relatively short space of time. Um, give me your first thing you think went well. I'm, I'm right there with you. The fact that this thing fired, right? Like, this was a crazy idea I had that came about because I was just doing some cold calls on a slow day at work. Um, and we got it together. We got enough people to do it. Um, it didn't financially destroy us, which was, which was a possibility. Um, so the fact that this came off as viable, I think, is... <laughs> the 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 biggest thing to me is is that this worked. Um, I think in terms of things that went well, I was actually happy with. Um, I think we did a better job advertising. Um, I realized we we went through Facebook primarily and our group, but we we were consistent about publishing stuff once a week. And if there's one thing that I've kind of learned in the course of planning events, because I I do it for my high school all the time and the club that I'm the clubs that I'm running is there's so many different pulls on people's attention that it's very easy to forget all the different events and things that you have as options that are floating around you as ways to spend your time. And I find that in my case, if I'm not reminded on a regular basis of something that I'd planned on doing, I will often forget. So I think I'm really happy with how consistent we were in sticking to a plan in terms of like, publishing articles, keeping people posted, putting stuff on the event and things like that. So I'm happy about that. Uh, any other things you were really happy with overall? I got to say participation, like the, and not just like people showing up, but I mean like more than half the guys dressed up, you know, it's kind of a silly thing to do because it's talk like a pirate day, which we really didn't do all that much talking like pirates, but um, our guys did come dressed in period attire. Now we did incentivize that a little bit, but um, you know, they don't have to. And it kind of played with scores a little, but not really that much. So I I'm I'm proud to see that everybody got into into the spirit of the event. Um, let's now talk about things we would shift or or do differently. Um I will start and I will say that despite the fact that I'm happy that we were consistent in terms of advertising once we had picked the date. Uh, I would have given people more notice. So like in future, when we plan an event like this, I'd like them to have like four months lead time where it's like, here's the date. We know well in advance. It gives us more time to plug it and people more time to make their arrangements. Um, and it makes it less likely that people already have something conflicting with it. So I would, I would plan farther ahead, I would say. Um, what's your first thing you'd do differently? Mm. Yeah, that's kind of one of the things is uh, getting the next thing organized. I do want to have more lead time. Um, going back to the fact that we only did this on Facebook, um, I advertised a little bit within my own local club via email, and that got one or two of the guys that we got. Um, but the fact that we only kept it to Facebook, there are a lot of non-Facebook war gamers. I have no idea how to contact them, but we need to figure that one out because there were people who heard about this last minute and were like, oh, I, like, I wish I could have come. But they had no idea. And I, I would love to figure out a way to, to 
talk to those folks um, and and invite them to these events. Yeah, I, I hear that. Because we're, um, we're, we're I, I'd estimate that we're cutting our audience in half by only talking to Facebook groups. No, I would agree. I would, you know, we advertise on here, but we know that there's only a, a handful of awesome people that are are checking it out. Most people already know about the game are the ones that are listening to this. So new players that we might snag probably wouldn't have stumbled upon this podcast and said, oh, I'm going to pay $40 at a hotel to travel to, uh, you know, to the coast of Maryland. Um, but we had that said, we had people from a pretty far distance away. I, I was really impressed with with how far people came um, because that was that was great. Yeah, excluding you, we had North Carolina, we had Pennsylvania, we had, I think, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, obviously. Um, so five states, plus yeah. plus yours. Yeah, plus me. So, yeah, so from North Carolina to Pennsylvania. I was going to try to drag some people with me, but um, they all got busy at the last minute. I would say other things I would do differently, um, both of them really just personal things, I would say. Uh, number one, I would not do it in September again, um, just because of the way my schedule works as a teacher. Um, I, it, I didn't take a day off on Friday. Instead, I left from school and got down around 10 p.m. Um, so I was in the car for about seven and a half hours because I hit multiple traffic getting out of New York City, um, which is always a mess. It, it's hard to hit at the right time, but uh, I think if it were in a different month when I wasn't just starting up, you know, the school year, I wouldn't have, I would have been better prepared. I would have been packed better. I would have had more of the sheets and stuff that I, I had intended to bring. I, and I would have been able to kind of lean less heavily on, on you to do most of the logistical stuff, even though you weren't that much closer than me, realistically. Um, the second thing I would do is I just need to better organize my stuff. Because I cram it into boxes, I have a kind of general plan of organization, but I think, like, I want to have, here's my demo box with both of the armies. I want to have the lists ready to go for new players with the minis already arranged. So I can just hand somebody a box with an activation deck, with some dice, with some markers, with the models, with the list, um, and then just be done. And you handled most of that because you were, you were better prepared than me. But I think in future, I'd like to have like two of those lists ready to go to hand someone and to have each table kind of, I think uh, Kurt, Kurt Reese used to do this where he, and, and Battlefront does too, where you have like a little picture of what the table's supposed to look like and yeah. everything's in that box. And this way you just pull it out and anybody can set it up. It's, he's got it down. You know, he knows what he's doing. Yeah. You're talking about Kurt Reese's tournament at can. Yes, 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 yeah. yes. No, I, actually, I've stolen that idea. Uh, thank you, Kurt. If I don't know if you're listening to this, uh, I know it's not really your system, but much much appreciation to you and what you've done. Um, I kind of have that in that I I think you've seen this in like I have those little tubs that all the terrain goes into, and two of the tubs, like the Easter Island tub and the Jungle Ruins tub, those are independent tables that are like you just take that tub and go find a mat to put it on. And that is all the terrain you need for that table. There's no picture to go with it yet. But in my mind, I want that with all of the tubs. So I actually have more tubs at home that I'm ready to do that with. I just need to get it done, get more. Honestly, I want a lot more scatter terrain for these things. Because it's like, here's some buildings, here's some forests. But like we want some fences. We want piles of stuff to hide behind. Because you know, cover, everybody knows covering this game is a big thing. And just having buildings and trees is not really enough. You want fences. You want broken down wagon carts. You want anything you can hide behind to help you get some cover. Um... So having that tournament in the can ready to go has been a goal of mine. I started working towards it before COVID when everything got shut down right before our Cold Wars tournament in 2020. Um, and I just need to get that organized. I've got a whole bunch more trees and things I need to make. And then I think I'll be able to just prep all of those boxes and have them ready to go. Well, we have some... We've created a lot of projects for ourselves. We're very good at doing that. <laughs> Speaking of upcoming, uh, what's what is what's next? So I think we 
may disappoint people when we say this, but this was a lot of work and it took a lot of our time, mostly Glenn's time. So the, we also have a ton of holidays coming up, family obligations, work obligations. So we know for a fact that we are not going to be um, running a big destination tournament anytime like for the remainder of this year. Um, so the next time we would do something would likely be in the spring, um, you know, possibly in, in May. Uh, but, you know, we'll, we'll keep you posted. We, I know that I will not be um, at Fall In. You know, you will be, I believe, is, is your plan. But you were still... I, th I think it's me fence. alone. Yeah, it's you alone. Because I know Mitch can't go. He has something else. So it, you'd, you'd be solo. Um, and I don't, I don't... From the, what we've been told, I don't think Firelock will be there either. So I think it literally will just be me and we'll just be kind if... of NDNG slash official capacity yeah yeah well um i know that i'm going to cold wars and my ambition would be to like run an actual uh, convention game and not just a tournament um because i'm trying to cut down on the amount of stuff i do because I, I have a lot of fun doing this but when i go to a con and i pay for the hotel i don't want to be kind of like working the entire time i'd like to you know i'd like to explore the convention and see all the cool games that people have designed and um I'm I'm good just devoting like one day to like you know going full out firelock everything, and then um, kind of floating around for the rest, which is what we aim to do, but we don't always succeed. Um, and and with that, I will say, uh, with we are 42 minutes in to part two. I I do want to say yeah, I'll be at November at, at Fallen in November doing the C tournament, and we'll be at Cold Wars. There will probably be some local stuff that we organize in the meantime. And by say I, we, I mean I'll be doing probably some stuff with Preston at Critical Hits. Um, but if anybody has ideas for a destination tournament, and maybe you have an inroad with a local museum or something like that, feel free to reach out. I will happily organize something. I know somebody, is, uh, some of our southern listeners have mentioned doing something at the Blackbeard Museum down in South Carolina. Uh, some other people have mentioned doing something at St. Augustine in Florida or um, Jacksonville. One of those two. I, I keep getting something in there confused, but there's some kind of festival that goes on in one of those cities that they've mentioned us going to. You know, I have no problem traveling to do a destination tournament that's the entire idea uh however i will say this one was kind of off the cuff and it started in with me like like i said doing a, a cold call in like april or may and then you know we did it in september so that's still like a four or five month lead time and that was a rushed version so if you have ideas, start bringing them to me. I'd have no problem with starting to plan them this year. We're just saying we're not going to do anything this year because there isn't the time for it. There's no time for it, yeah. But I will say that we pulled it off. And this shows that this is viable. It's something that people would do. Um, and if it's something that you want to do in the future, but you didn't get a chance to come to this one, then you know, drop us a line and let us know what sort of things you might like and We'll do the best to kind of get that planned out. But it would just be, we now know what it entails in terms of, you know, time commitment, lead time and planning. And so we would we would start planning for stuff in the spring now. Another idea that had been floated, although this would not be a tournament or game day, so to speak, you can rent or at least book the Kaimar Nikel which is a, a sailing ship that operates within the Chesapeake um, at certain times of year to just, you know, go on a sailing ship for the day and you go kind of down and then back up the Chesapeake Bay. Um, I would be interested in doing that and organizing it as a group thing. Um, like I said, it I don't think we could in any way arrange a game or games or a tournament on board, that kind of thing. Um, but I do think it would be really cool to get a large group of Blood and Plunder players um, and maybe some of the, you know, quote, celebrities uh, together and do a, um, a, 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 a one-day journey 
a three hour tour, so to speak. Yeah, or you could um, book a block of rooms at a hotel, use their convention area, and then have that be an activity. Like the I mean, maybe day. maybe we make it an entire weekend. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. We, yeah. we 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 can try and figure that out. That's that's another idea that's floated out there. So if you got some crazy idea like that, I'd love to hear it because I'll look into the feasibility of doing that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for blood and pedantry. Um, last time I asked a question that Glenn felt was needlessly complicated, um, because I'm from here and I wanted to be annoying. So um, we did have uh, eleven correct answers which was impressive. And I don't think we sent out a last minute warning this time to tell people that we were recording. Cause as we record, it is October 4th, which would mean that if I get my act together properly, I can release this by Tuesday, the 11th, which shouldn't be a problem unless disaster strikes. And I have to, you know, I don't even know, fix a sewage pipe or, you know, wash the asbestos out of my hair. Anyway, I mean, Ian's Ian's already gone through, and I don't think we have any other hurricanes lined up at the moment. Not for Connecticut. <laughs> All right. So, last time, the question: um, On September eighth, sixteen sixty four, an English naval squadron under the command of Colonel Richard Nichols sailed into a harbor in New England and forced the surrender of the Dutch capital of New Netherlands. This is a multi part question. One: Who was the governor of the city in question at the time of its capture? Two, what was the name of the city changed to after the victory over the Dutch? And three, in what year did the Dutch temporarily regain control over the city before losing it after only one year? And the answer was Peter Stuyvesant was the governor, um, who everybody hated, apparently, which is why they were so easily able to surrender. They were really looking forward to any opportunity to do so. It was renamed New York. And the Dutch retook the city in 1673. Um, so of the winners, we have 10 possibles. I am going to roll a d10. And survey says we've got number, number eight, um, which would be... <laughs> We were CJ. debating how to say your name ahead of this. Okay, yeah. I so this is CJ Michekaron is going to be my best guess. So I'm guessing C it's McCacron. Oh, McCacron. That makes more sense. Okay. Watch. It's going to be probably butchering it, So please, we're, we'll email I, you, but please send back like the phonetic. Yeah, the phonetic pronunciation you of your name. Um. I will say that, like, it's, you know, sometimes people send the phonetic pronunciations of names and, like, people still mess it up, but we'll make an effort to to correct it. It is important to me that I try. Like, my wife, who's, whose maiden name is McSherry, uh, when she graduated from, from, uh, her, from Fordham with a master's degree, she was angry that they had somehow mispronounced her name for undergrad. So she wrote out the phonetic pronunciation of her name, McSherry. And when the time came for her to get up on the stage, the person looks at the card and just says, um, and her name is, is Angela, just goes, um, and, and Angelica Muyanese. Mu, 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 Mu and it's like, how did you get there? Um, so CJ, if that's what we're doing to you, I'm genuinely sorry. <laughs> But um, we will email you to send you your capers and militia blisters. Um, and Glenn's going to be smart enough to actually highlight the person this time in case we, we don't do this right away and goof around. All right. I this I'll time. I'll read this one. This time. You're going to read it out. So, Yeah, this is another one from Tom. So it is, it's long, but this one is a little bit early, easier, I think. It's, I think it's way easier. I think it's too easy. Yes. Uh, born around 1540, no one is really sure, to a family of farmers in England entering the world of sailing by his early 20s. He served aboard a slave ship that was attacked by the Spanish, which then quickly launched a career of becoming a bit of a terror on the high seas. He almost immediately entered the world of privateering, which in this case meant somewhat clandestine raids sanctioned by Queen Elizabeth I. In 1570, she commissioned him and two ships on a series of privateering raids on the Spanish, essentially to hijack some of their goods. 
Historians hotly debate whether or not this privateer, some would argue pirate, depending on if you're wearing uh, conquistador armor, made it to Oregon. Who is that pirate? Now, in order to answer the question, you will need to email us at Tales of the sale, all one word, at gmail.com. So, Tales of the Spell, Sail, Tail spelled, yes, says, Tales of the Sale, Tail spelled T A L E S, um, Tales of the Sale at gmail.com. Before we record next time, the prize at stake is going to be a blister of European sailors and a commander figurine of indeterminate type. Yes. Um, all right. Up, Upcoming events, we only have a handful. I, I am tr- I'm still trying to get this together, but I need to have a conversation with Andrew. Um, so Andrew Galbury and Chris Retz are part of the Uxbridge Historical Gaming Club. They are looking to hold the tournaments on November 19th. Um, even if it's just a gaming day, uh, we'll do our best to kind of figure that out. And uh, you're doing the next one? Yeah, I'll get the next two. Uh, Fallen Masts Tournament. The Fall In Sea Tournament uh, is 200 points, running in from 2 to 8 p.m. on Saturday at Fall In, which the exact date of that Saturday is uh, the 5th of November. So if you want, you can show up in your Guy Fox mask, although it'll be not entirely anachronistic. Mm, yeah. Um, yeah, so... We hope to see you there if you are in the Northeast or Mid-Atlantic seaboard at all. Uh, Following that, um, the next known thing is Cold Wars, but it's not all that known because the date is still TBD, um, according to the official HMGS website that I just looked up. They're in finalizing negotiations and won't know until allegedly October 16th. So, so by, the, by the time we record next, we will likely have dates and yes, we'll for advertise you in that, that one. <laughs> of course, the next one we'll be advertising will probably we might be recording post uh, fall in. I don't know how that's going to work very well, so we'll figure it out. Um, well, if anybody thanks. else has anything going on, uh, feel free to email us. We will advertise for you. Um, I am doing. It's not Blood and Plunder related, Tom, and I'm springing this one on you. Um, I'm doing my now yearly uh, charity Toys for Tots event uh, for By Fire and Sword at Games and Stuff on December 3rd. Or is it the 10th? Contact me. I'll let you know. Um, but we're doing a big by fire and sword game you don't have to have minis just show up i will provide things you can learn to play it's the same period uh but it does focus on eastern europe um and again it's for toys for tots so the big focus is on the kids uh the entrance fee is one toy and then we do re-roll tickets probably i'd love to figure out something to do with blood and plunder for that well, thank you for sticking with us for what is a supersized episode, um, because we had a lot to talk about. We had the summer campaign to discuss, and we had Joe Forrester on. Um, and so we will see you next time. Um, if you are at Fallen, Glenn will see you. So go say hi. And we will be recording again probably after that in November. And hopefully we have some exciting news to share about all the rays. The black stuff that's going to be dropping really soon, which a handful of people have already started to see, but um, we haven't gotten our mitts on it yet. So we will keep you posted when we do. Um, And that's it. So I think, Glenn, you go ahead and take us out. Well, once again, everybody, thank you. Can't do it without you. We appreciate you coming and listening to us talk for what is probably a very long time. And we do look forward to seeing you at whatever event we get to run next time. So thanks again for coming and have a good one. Thanks so much for joining the show tonight. Remember to follow us on Twitter at No Dice, No Glory. And keep the conversation going on NoDiceNoGlory.com, now featuring our own message boards. Have a great night, everybody.